Chapter 25 of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Washington, Atlanta. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter 25 Going to the Derby do they have as much fun at the derby as they used to i heard an old gentleman in a white hat canary gloves and button boots ask a fellow passenger in a london train fun no one would hardly call it that looking back on it after forty years one would no doubt call it fun but it is certainly not fun while it lasts the two most important features of the derby are getting there and getting away again. Getting there is harder work than bricklaying or journalism. You may ride in a motor car, but your motor will be as useless to you as a submarine in a swimming bath. From Sutton to Epsom, and from Epsom to the Downs, a long procession of motor cars, buses, wagonettes, green grocer's carts, lorries school carts drays and human beings stretches like a serpent of infinite length a serpent that is apparently too sick to move one thinks of it as an old serpent that has made itself very ill by swallowing machinery every few minutes it gives the machinery in its inward parts a shake it makes one more effort to crawl a queer rattle shiver and groan run through it from tip to tail but the effort is too much for it. It immediately subsides on a lame and impotent stomach, and hour after hour passes with no other diversion except the antics of an occasional nervous horse that rises on his hind legs and waves his forefeet in the back of your neck over the hood of the car. There is a common belief that the crowd that goes to the derby is a cheerful crowd, that it sings and plays concertinas and changes hats. There could not be a greater delusion. It is as quiet and determined as a procession of men and women going to hear Dr. Horton preaching at Hampstead. Not a song. Well, one song. Not a joke. Well, one joke. When a fat man saw a poor brown lop-eared ass in a field of daisies and called out, there's the winner of the derby he apparently felt it was a very good joke for he repeated it to parties on tops of buses and parties on green grocers carts and parties in furniture vans the sun however was unpropitious for jokes even the east ender who had worked an edging of red and white wool into its pony's mane and hung rosettes of red white and blue at its ears was too busy perspiring and hating his hundred thousand neighbors to smile he was also weighing his chances of getting to epsom downs before judgment day i admired his spirit in waving the whip with a knot of colored ribbons there was little other color to be seen we were a procession of victims red as beef steaming like the window of a fried fish shop dusty swollen vein and we could only sink back helpless and gasping in the grip of the monstrous procession of wheeled things that advanced more slowly than any snail that was ever known on this side of the ural mountains i doubt if that procession ever reached epsom downs i did so only because i got out and walked and even then the first two races were over half england seemed already to have arrived on the hills and to have pitched its wigwams there the other half was blocking up the road for ten miles back and could not possibly arrive in time for the derby but the half who had arrived had already set up a city of booths and flags on hill after hill as far as the eye could see there may have been encampments of this vastness in the days of xerxes but surely never since it was oppressive overwhelming there were so many people there that there was no room for anybody there was no room so far as i could see for the man who plays the three-card trick on the top of an open umbrella or for the man with the tape and pencil and even the beggars who pray by the roadside for your success were few there was simply a crush an enormous sweltering 
an appallingly silent crush. Even the bookmaker seemed to be awed by it. They stood on their stands beside blackboards full of horses' names and mystical figures, but they did not yell at you, hoarsely, bullingly, as bookmakers ought to do. If, having looked at the elephantine portrait advertisement of one of them, you wish to bet with him, he will consent in a listless way and say wearily to his clerk, Nine, nine, one, seventy shillings to a dollar, Palumetis, as he handed you a blue, red, and green card. I do not blame him for not being enthusiastic. I am myself no longer enthusiastic about Palumetis. Still, one wished for a little violence, besides the violence of the sun, and of the man who tried to sell you a shilling's worth of sausage, and who said he was the only firm, the only firm in the place. Camden Town on a Saturday night could give points to Derby Day for color and uproar. Derby Day is so big, perhaps, that it is frightened of itself. But I forgot. There was one violent man. He was fat, hatless, and sweating, and he was hoarse, with shouting superlatives about his tips to a circle of poor old men, dunches in caps, small boys in jerseys, and tired-looking country girls. If only I could tell you where I got my information, he declared. You'd, you'd be surprised. If any of you has got 25 pound about them, if you've got even a tenner, why, you've only got 10 bob. Well, you can't exactly have a gamble for ten bob, but you can have a bit of fun anyway. If you take my advice, it's here on this bit of paper. You can have it for a bob. I can give you three horses, and that'll turn your ten bob into a tenner, see? Some people tell you Tetratema's going to win. He made a face of disgust, popularly known as giving Tetratema the raspberry. Don't you believe it? Didn't I tell you, Tag Rag? Didn't I tell you, every on? Here, take my tip, and you'll dance all the way on with joy tonight. Dance while you'll go on jazzing all the way. And he spread out his fat hands and threw out his fat stomach and danced on the grass, just to show one how one ought to behave if one back the derby winner. Meanwhile, his partner, dressed as a red and white jockey in a peaked cap and incongruous putties, moved around the circle, thrusting his slips of tips almost angrily on us. Go on, he ordered us. What's a bob to a gambler? You people read the papers and believe what you see in them. The papers? I tell you straight, the worst pack of rogues and bookmakers in England. A simple old man of ninety who had lost his teeth beckoned to him and paid him a shilling for his tip. The jockey took him aside and whispered impressively into his ear. Then he said in a loud voice, Are you satisfied, sir? Quite satisfied, quavered the old man. I wish I could have stayed near him. I should have liked to have seen him jazzing later in the evening. Sausages, lemonade, fried fish, chewing gum, Bets, ladies standing on the roofs of taxis, a try-your-strength machine, extemporized conveniences of civilization, with youths standing by them and yelling, Commodation! Hills of humanity in all attitudes of dazedness and despair, the thunder and the shouting of the distant bookmakers under the stands, the quiet of the 10,000 freelance bookmakers who were I suppose, breaking the law in the open spaces, the dust, the sun, the smell, faces smeary with fruit, the cunning tinker in an old khaki hat with striped ribbon who was selling some two-penny instrument that was supposed to imitate either the bark of a dog or the song of a nightingale. One could not tell which from the noise he made with it. Stand after stand, packed to the sky with what are called serried ranks of human beings who looked like immense banks of many-colored shingle, and who, as they raised a million pairs of field glasses to two million eyes, scintillated in the distance like a bank of shingle after a wave has broken on it on a tropical noon. It certainly was an amazing medley of spectacle and a door. It is said that an important horse race took place. It is even said that Palumetis ran in it. 
looked for him everywhere, over people's heads, under people's heads, through motor buses, round the corners of refreshment tents, in the sky above, and on the earth beneath. But no Polymetis was to be seen anywhere, except on my race card, where I read about his lilac-colored jockey. A jockey in lilac? How beautiful! How Japanese! And, indeed, all the jockeys, as they paraded down the field before the race, seemed to have robbed a rainbow. They brought meaning and beauty into an otherwise bald and unconvincing mob. I assure you, I love horse racing, if I could see it. But of all the people who congregated the little crooked hills of Epsom, I doubt if ten people in a hundred saw it. You knew the horses had started only because, as you lay dreaming, the million people on the stands suddenly made you jump with a loud, sharp, and terrifying bark, which said, They're off, in one syllable. Then there was deep silence, and somebody near me said, The favorite can't be leading, or they would be shouting. Then from the stands came a murmur like bees, a muttering as of a man talking in his sleep, a growling as of a wind in a cave. This only served to intensify the silence of a defeated people. One knew that something awful must be happening. Perhaps even Palu Metis was winning. Above the heads of the crowd, the heads of the jockeys began to be visible. A fool cried out, The favorite wins! Another, Allen by has it! Then one had a glimpse of three horses close. Well, fairly close on each other's tails, and none of them the gray tetratema. I noticed that on one of them crouched a jockey in exquisite grass green. He passed like a fine phrase out of a poem of which one does not know the rest. But I did not really know who had won until the numbers were put up on the board. Then a badly shaven man in a bowler cried, Spion Cup has won! Bravo! and clapped his friend on the back. The rest of us looked at him with contempt. The tinker-nosed man who played the instrument that sang like a dog or barked like a nightingale began to squeak it into people's ears. The crowd began pouring itself through itself, and the dust from its feet rose like a cloud till it was difficult to see across the course. And the motor car broke down on the way home, and Palometus didn't win, and I'm as tired as a dog and so say all of us. End of chapter 25. Recording by Monica Washington, Atlanta.